Thank you, guys. I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is uh, Michael, Michael Ada. I'm the VP Engineering of uh, Binaris. And you can find me on Twitter. That's my handle, obviously. About uh, three years ago or so, uh, uh, I encountered the concept of uh, serverless, serverless functions, specifically. And my jaw just dropped. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, um, I could um, generate prototypes and uh, add features to products with almost no effort on my end. And what I envision is that all the applications eventually will be built purely out of functions. And that's maybe a bit of a, a lie, because I consider other people functions as functions, or they're more commonly known as services. Right? So uh, uh, I see the future as something where we pick up other uh, uh, um, people's code, uh, all the services uh, uh, that exist, such as uh, Twilio, SendGrid, and my rationale is that if I don't care about the servers that they run on, and I don't have to worry about uh, uh, any uh, consideration, it's as equal as a function that someone from another team in my company wrote. And that's the epic of writing code. Uh, I might even say that uh, an unpopular opinion, but uh, as a developer and an engineer, I think that the less code I write is better. I know it sounds counterproductive, but uh, I'm probably the worst programmer here in the room, so whenever I write code, somehow bugs lurk in. And I love writing code, but I hate, really hate, debugging. And when I can get a function from someone else, a service basically, then I don't have to worry about that. Um, so that gives me the power to just write the logic that I have for my business need and a function. Um, Luckily, that's also the best way that we build uh, uh, software, right? Because we think in functions. And again, I'm going to say something that is unpopular, but we're already doing that. Every developer I know, when they write their next uh, uh, application or microservice or even a monolith, they break it up to functions already, right? So if I write, let's say I'm a Node.js developer, I have my express uh, uh, server, and it has some routes, and at the end of every route, every endpoint, there runs a function, right? I even feed the, the event loop with a function. And obviously, if I'm uh, 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 nifty, I use core and not express nowadays. And if I'm Python, I'll use Flask, but it's the same thing. We like to think, think in functions. And even 20 years ago, when we wrote CGI scripts to power our engines, we, we consider them as procedures or functions, which is basically the same thing. So what is the big change? In that sense is now every function is deployable on its own. And that gives us a lot of power. I don't have to worry about the infrastructure that runs the function. I can deploy them separately. It's even better than microservices. It's obviously an extension of that trend. But by deploying them separately, I gain um, separation of concerns, I again uh, improve the uh, uh, robustness, faster uh, 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 development time. And also, uh, um, um, the benefit of, for example, separation of uh, uh, the least privileged uh, uh, um, concerns, right? If I have, say, a CRUD that has uh, uh, two functions, one to update uh, um, the user uh, profile, one to read the user profile, I can give them different uh, privileges, different IAM roles if we're in the AWS uh, uh, world, and I gain improved security. I also find functions very useful because they enforce or reinforce uh, uh, the tendencies we already know how to design our code, specifically the statelessness of code. Because with functions, whether you like it or not, unlike the ECS or Kubernetes or Fargate or any other old VMs with old, uh, auto scaling groups, or God forbid, if you have your own pet server uh, sitting somewhere on premises, then with functions, you no longer contain the runtime and when it will be disappeared. So it forces us to use good practices of distributed design and save the state somewhere else. For example, DynamoDB, as the previous uh, um, presenters uh, say, is an excellent uh, way to get that. And it's also excellent because it's serverless in nature. You don't have, nowadays, with uh, uh, on demand, you really don't have to think about scale. We use that too. It's excellent. And, and Someone else maintain the servers, whereas there's a bug, at most I have to uh, uh, um, contact AWS support and uh, uh, fix that. It's not my responsibility, so that's uh, cool. So the pinnacle of the um, serverless revolution, which is, as I said, not really a revolution, but a 
uh, a continuation of a trend is not to think about servers. Unfortunately, uh, um, while my enthusiasm three years ago was great, and I still think that that will be the future, there are several uh, obstacles. And in order for us not to think about servers, we have to not think about cost and not think about performance. And to show why it's important, I've designed uh, uh, um, an application that I think most of you uh, know, uh, an Uber-like application. You have to be a green alien, uh, I hope. So I won't explain what it does. You basically uh, use your phone to uh, hail a taxi. It comes and gets you. And we'll try to design uh, um, the microservices that needs to implement such a, a nice application and see what we can do with functions, specifically with AWS Lambda. Uh, being a vendor myself, uh, I know that it's always frustrating that people use Lambda as the example, but it is the most common one, so uh, um, I think that will make the life of everyone easy. Uh, so we start with the single most important thing for any application, it's users, right? And for a, a, a taxi hailing um, service, it's the passengers, those that are gonna ride. And obviously they won't come to the platform if there are no trips to be made. So that little uh, circle or uh, uh, ellipse is uh, basically a microservice. So when I write passengers, I really mean that's the service that, for example, have me uh, register a new passenger or update his uh, uh, billing details. We didn't have a billing service yet, but we'll have shortly. And all the other things that the passenger want to do. Right, and the reason it's microservice because behind the scenes you'll have your DynamoDB or uh, uh, Redis as a service or Postgres, I don't really care for the matter of this presentation, but you'll have some separated storage again, which is the good uh, uh, practice. And trips are very uh, beneficial for us as a company when we develop this application because now we can get to billing once they are completed. And hopefully, as I said, you'll use someone else's functions to do the actual billing, so Stripe, in that sense is a, a great uh, a function or micro microservice or call it whatever you want. That is excellent without having some drivers to take us from uh, one place to another, it will be very difficult for us uh, uh, to do. And drivers, as we all know, demand payments. And unfortunately, that has different sets of um, constraints. Usually you bill the customers daily or almost immediately with your billing. Payments are usually once per month. Uh, uh, sorry, payments are usually once per month. And you do a, a wire transfer or different methods. It's a, a different mechanism. And now that we also started to actually get uh, uh, charge people and pay people uh, money, we want to authenticate everything, right? We don't want anyone to be able to add uh, passengers and drivers or fake trips because we'll have to pay for them. Uh, which is not good, so we have an authentication service, and you can see that authentication is also dotted because hopefully you manage to find one of the very excellent authentication uh, and user management uh, already existing services, such as Auth0, Cogito, and many others. So uh, hopefully you don't have to write any code. But you do still have to connect your passenger service to the authentication, your driver service to the authentication, your trip service to the authentication, which creates a lot of hassle. So being a, a lazy developer, uh, I fall back to a, a very common pattern of having an API gateway and have everything authenticated at the perimeter. That means that my uh, gateway basically authenticates and dispatches uh, um, requests to the right services internally and the in entire uh, um, uh, secured uh, service of the application need not do that. Maybe most applications actually need some uh, um, um, authorization and not authentication within them, but we want to keep that a bit simple. You'll notice that the API gateway is uh, uh, dotted as well, but not the same dot, because unfortunately, uh, it will not be so easy to do that serverless in real life. Uh, sure, there's AP Sorry, sure, there's API gateway, uh, an excellent service from uh, uh, Lambda. If you do, um, if you have specific uh, uh, constraints that allow you, it adds usually more latency, for example, than the Lambda itself. Uh, unless you're uh, outside, the, uh, inside the VPC, and then changes matter because <laughs> it's actually uh, about the same thing, and also the cost is, is very high. So, but we'll see later why we have to do that. Um, since we're building a full real life uh, uh, application, we'll also need to notify the users whenever they get charged, whenever they get billed, whenever uh, uh, basically they want, if they have limits, 
or uh, uh, need, so we'll add a, a, a notification service. And that notification service, hopefully, will use Twilio and SendGrid because we don't like writing stuff that other people have written. And I personally also believe that many of those uh, similar building blocks will be in the future replaced by services because writing services became more easy with the, the serverless revolution. So I anticipate us writing even less code uh, in the future, which is great. But none of that would matter if we can't dispatch uh, um, uh, taxis to our passengers, right? So instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, let's look at how it works in brick and mortar uh, taxi stations, at least in Israel. I'm, I think it's almost the same worldwide. So uh, what happens is that you call the, the dispatch, the operator. He asks you where you want to go, what your preferences. Usually preferences are not that uh, as sophisticated in such a small uh, operation. It uses the radio to uh, uh, broadcast the information to all the cars, to all the drivers. And whomever is available and willing to take that ride, uh, say, I'll take it. And then basically, he connects the two people and creates a trip. Right, so translating that to a digital uh, application is very s straightforward, right? We had a dispatch service. Again, you can only do that after you're authenticated and you have, say, a billing um, uh, credentials in your billing details in your uh, uh, um, passenger uh, uh, profile. And when you want to dispatch something, we go to the passenger service, we get all the preferences, we go to all the drivers. It's a bit inefficient get the entire list of the driver and choose. Right now, we don't have any way to choose based on, but let's say that it's a random uh, operation, and then we create a trip. Hooray, that's a first full round uh, uh, billing and payment uh, uh, cycle. Our application is operational. Uh, uh, we can even go without some of the stuff when we prototype. Maybe you didn't, didn't even go microservices. You usually want to start with something uh, simpler, but that enables us, uh, or maybe have the entire thing in a single uh, uh, Lambda initially to, to proof it, right, as an um, initial uh, uh, POC. But obviously, uh, uh, a real uh, dispatcher will use, uh, um, so, okay, so a real dispatcher will, will not uh, uh, just hail all the cars and pick one at random. It also know when it will arrive. That's like one of the single most important consideration for um, dispatches, when will the uh, car be at the user location, right? So we add a function that we call uh, a, a service that we call ETA, estimated time of arrival. And that's actually not that uh, uh, easy to do. Uh, there are many different algorithms uh, to do that. They are mostly based on uh, graph and connectiveness, and uh, you have to model the entire road network as uh, uh, weighted uh, uh, graphs but it's doable, and that enables the, the dispatcher service to choose a car in a smart way and uh, increase the number of rides we're seeing. So we added an ETA uh, service and a road service, and right now we don't know yet what will be in functions and what not. That's the exercise that we're gonna go. Uh, the last thing, now that we're being successful, is that as our operation grows and we have way more drivers and way more dispatches, obviously the, the mechanism of triggering uh, um, uh, asking all the drivers where they are and calculating becomes a, a, a blocking uh, aspect because we, if we have thousands or a hundred of thousands of drivers, that's unfeasible. We'll have a lot of errors and costly because actually the, the ETA calculation is a mathematical uh, uh, burden on the CPU. So we want to replace simply get all cars by get nearby cars, right? Or get nearby drivers. Uh, it makes sense in a local small station. It doesn't, there is no uh, uh, mapping, unfortunately, for our digital uh, uh, world. So we have to resort to some more uh, um, complex mechanism. Luckily, uh, uh, there's a very easy way. Uh, easy means other smart people developed a way to do it, and I don't have to care about it. Uh, uh, to, to shard the earth into small cells. There's a great library from Amazon, uh, sorry, from Google called S2 Geometry. Uh, basically what it does, it takes the Earth and takes a cube and projects er the Earth on a cube. And a cube is something that is easy to uh, divide. So you can divide it up to 30 layers, if I remember correctly, in the uh, original service. And it gives you uh, uh, three centimeter by three centimeter on average, because the Earth is not a cube, uh, uh, pieces, cells. And you can use that cell as an ID. Cell ID, when you get a, a latitude and a longitude, 
uh, to shard the data. And now we shard the data, it's very easy to get only the nearby uh, um, dri drivers and cars. And you also, the cell IDs are, uh, uh, you, you map them use, uh, using a, a surface filling curve, uh, uh, so that's easy to um, find uh, uh, nearby places. So now that we have, we are armed with our GEO uh, service that basically uh, collects the data from all the cars. In real life examples, for example, in uh, Uber, they collect every four to five seconds data from all the cars that exist in their fleet. Uh, so that's a very serious burden. Um, and they shard it, and it works well, as you hopefully know. Uh, uh, we can even improve uh, a, a little more, and instead of just getting the nearby cars, we can get the preferences, not the preferences, the profile of the car to match it to the user preferences. Let's say that we have, uh, um, I don't know how Uber operates here, but in some places you can have uh, uh, big cars with more seats and places to put your baggage and stuff like that. So we can enhance that. And it's easy to do. We don't even have to add a new uh, a service. That's for me, whenever I come up to some architecture, I like to do what I call a dif differential architecture. Uh, uh, so I do different uh, changes on the architecture and say, what would happen if, let's say, we're in Holland, right, in the Netherlands. What happens if instead of cars, I want to add a service for uh, um, uh, uh, bikes? How would the architecture change? And luckily, it doesn't change at all. So I might have to have uh, improved the road graph to contain uh, uh, um, edges and links for uh, um, bike lanes. Uh, but other than that, there's no huge uh, uh, difference. And similarly, if you want to have a, a share uh, a car system, that would uh, remain the same. So that's good. It means that we're happy with the architecture. Uh, another note is the real life, that's actually a real, uh, uh, the real Uber uh, uh, architecture. It's, while we do it as a mock-up and it's nice to see on screen, it's derived from blog post of Uber on how they build their system. When they uh, uh, moved from monolith to microservices um, three years ago, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, then, yeah, three years ago, uh, they blogged a lot about their uh, internal architecture, and that's a real architecture with one caveat that they actually use Kafka as, uh, obviously there's a lot of load here, and they use Kafka to stream and as a message passing uh, 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 transport. So uh, in real life, Geo, for example, gets a stream of all the locations, updates uh, the roads for map accuracy and stuff like that, but goes to the rider, drivers, ETA and dispatch, and everything is being tunneled in a row. It's, it's not very important. I decided to skip that because it adds, the architecture is already too co very complex. Didn't want to uh, um, make it even worse. Um, as we remember, the, the entire premise was to let's start and build it with functions, right? Because I want to write uh, uh, personally everything in functions if I can or not write them at all if I, that's even better. So this is a, a, an example code for a new driver. Uh, um, should be new driver and not driver the export um, service, a function that basically when a new driver arrives, uh, uh, creates something in the DynamoDB uh, uh, for the driver, for him, right? So it uses the binaris notation of functions. In binaris, if you do JSON in, JSON out uh, um, um, inputs, you don't have to provide everything else. And we also have um, embedded HTTP uh, uh, endpoint, so you, you can just call that, that would be a live function on the uh, internet, and, and we see that it uh, uh, maps well, because basically you do uh, some input validation, you call your DynamoDB, which is itself serverless, right? It's not serverless compute, it's not serverless function, it's serverless storage, much like S3 or any other uh, serverless storage, and you return the, the output. So that's great, it works well. And if we take another function, for example, the one that gets the driver information, not just register it, then uh, uh, it's similarly simple. Obviously, again, in real life, you wouldn't uh, uh, write such a skeleton of a function. You'll have to monitor, for example, uh, uh, if there are errors, you want to write, when you register stuff, uh, uh, you want to, uh, for example, the car type, uh, uh, keep it in the monitoring so you can later uh, know what type of uh, fleets you have. But luckily, the fact that you don't have to monitor the system itself, the, the VMs, the containers, gives you plenty of time to concentrate on what matters, which is your business needs, understanding and monitoring your application and, and the code that you write. And if you are like me, you only write what you must, that means that that's something that is business critical. 
Okay, so, so we're very happy, and, and with uh, uh, the driver service, we managed to write a binary function or a lambda, let's stick to lambda ecosystem for now, for it. And uh, uh, luckily, other CRUD-like services are easily written with lambdas as well. So the passenger service will have a very similar uh, uh, format, very similar uh, uh, way of building it from functions, and we gain the, the independence of uh, functions inside the service, the isolation, the privilege uh, uh, separation, so that's great. But as we understood, for example, the Geo application is not as simple as a, a CRUD, and if you go and try to do it with Lambda, you'll find that it's actually very difficult. You'll have to revert to some VM, container, Kubernetes, Fargate uh, solution. Let's see why. The first and foremost uh, uh, problem that you would have is cost. We said that Geo is, is generating trillions of events per day. And if you compare the raw, unfortunate uh, uh, price of Lambda and EC2, and that's on demand, by the way, uh, uh, prices, I'm assuming, uh, uh, I, I know you're also physically and using either reserved or spot instances, but for the sake of the comparison, we'll compare a, a simple on demand EC2 cost per gigabyte second and Lambda per gigabyte second. It's five times as expensive. So for CRUDs, how many times do I generate a new driver? It's not that frequent. Even if it was frequent, it's relatively uh, uh, cheap. When it gets to the trillion of invocation, that becomes a daunting task. Paying five times as much as my computer is something that most uh, um, companies would, would not want to do. So now, because of cost, I have to think about servers again, which I really don't like. So, uh, so that's bad, and, and even worse, is that if I look at the fine uh, uh, points of how uh, um, functions are charged, I'll see that they're actually charged in 100 millisecond units. So unless I have compute that is very lengthy, very lengthy is like a second for me, right? Because then the 100 millisecond is the, uh, an order of magnitude less, I will be paying a, a lot of money on computer that I never even used. And that's uh, uh, bad. Again, I don't like paying on stuff that I don't uh, uh, consume, but even worse, I, I don't want to pay more on the things that I'm already paying the most on, which is, that's the real problem. I don't mind paying, paying even 100 times on, on lambdas if it's for some uh, um, um, service that is not costing me as much. I don't care if I pay a cent or a dollar or 10 dollars a month, right? When it gets to the thousands and hundreds of thousands, then I, I'm really worried. And even worse, after taking the 100 milliseconds into account, you'll notice that if you do I.O. Uh, based um, um, type of uh, uh, function, then you cannot multiplex different invocations in the same runtime. So uh, uh, runtimes are dedicated to a single function at a time. There is strong isolation at the invocation level, which is good for some use cases for uh, security reasons and for CPU intensive. That's excellent because you can guarantee the performance. For IO, uh, uh, for example, for saving something into my Kafka stream, or uh, uh, a querying DynamoDB, it means that I have to pay for the time that the um, DynamoDB took to answer me, but I don't get to do anything else in that time, where if I would have written a regular microservice, other invocation would have kept flying in and would reuse that, would use that CPU and share that resource. So that became a, a, a problematic um, service to implement due to cost, and similarly, the API gateway being one that is invoked as often and usually the shortest path in the system because it just forwards uh, uh, things become uh, problematic. There are, as I said, uh, um, you can work around that. You have Kong and other API uh, services which are excellent, but you have to maintain, unfortunately, uh, uh, something to do them. They're not completely uh, um, serverless as far as I know. And you have API gateway, Amazon's own, AWS own API gateway, but as I said, it, it has a, um, severe latency and uh, uh, cost implications. So remembering that uh, maybe we lost the war for Geo. The, 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 the most important and the most uh, uh, complex part of our application is really the dispatch. That's why user pickers, right? We get, uh, uh, we send them a car the fastest. Uh, uh, we look at dispatch and say, okay, so what, what does it have to do? That there is a lot of uh, uh, um, calls, but not as many as reporting every five seconds from every car in our fleet. We dispatch, uh, when we get a dispatch request, we get the user profile, we find the nearby cars via Geo that runs on a uh, uh, server, unfortunately. We match all the car uh, um, 
profiles and preferences to see which servers are, uh, which uh, cars are matching and call the get ETA for those cars that are matching. Finally, choose a car and you don't see it here because it became too long, uh, uh, actually create a trip, right? So we have a one, two, three, four, five, six levels of chaining and uh, um, more than that, we have a, a map or two maps, but literally it's a, a map in between. A and just writing the code again to make it, uh, I see that I'm a little short on time, so maybe we'll skip uh, uh, the code. Um, so implementing the functions, implement the function with the, uh, implement the service with the function is easy enough uh, logically. But when I come and run it in real life, I found out that things are not working as expected because user gets seconds of delay before they get even the answer of which driver is available. Uh, uh, we at Pinaris have our own uh, tool to measure um, latency overhead. We call it FASMARC, F -A -A -S Mark. Um, but two weeks ago, um, Elbstack on Medium published his own uh, uh, vendor independent uh, um, benchmark, so I, I rather use that and have the credibility of someone that I have no ties to. Uh, it's actually a little worse than the numbers we're seeing. Uh, we measured functions running from functions, so we uh, neutralized the VPC overheads and uh, availability zones and uh, regions uh, uh, overheads. Um, but still, the average is around 100 milliseconds. It's, again, in our measurements, it's uh, uh, somewhere around 80, sometimes 60, depends. And, and uh, unfortunately, the, the 99 percentile, which matters a lot as well for the mapping, is uh, 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 that big. So to do something like that, we have to add the averages. Percentiles don't add, but averages add. And if we have a, a seven uh, a deep call with 100 millisecond delay, it means that 0.7 of, uh, of a second already got lost just on overhead before we started doing anything. Calculating the ETA is a CPU intensive work. It usually takes time. Accessing my DynamoDBs uh, takes time. Sure, we have caches, but not always. Uh, um, and that makes the responsiveness, the responsiveness uh, suffer. And, and uh, we have to revert to actually implement that using uh, uh, containers or Kubernetes and something like that. Um, as I said initially, the, the, in order for me to not think about servers, I have to not think about the cost and not think about uh, uh, performance, which is why, and now it's a shameless plug for uh, uh, Binaris, which is why at Binaris we're building a platform that address exactly those things. Uh, you can sign up uh, uh, for free on the web, go to binaris.com. We have uh, uh, three milliseconds uh, uh, invocation overheads, which is practically the same as you'll get from uh, uh, your containers uh, um, on your VPC. And we're always happy to help people uh, uh, use serverless. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your time. And if, if, if anyone has questions.